what Panksepp observed, and I think this is a brilliant piece of science, is that, first of all, juvenile male rats in particular like to rough and tumble play. They like to wrestle. And they actually pin each other, just like little kids do, or like adult wrestlers do. They pin their shoulders down, and that basically means you win. And so, okay, so that's pretty cool. But what's even cooler, I think, well, there's three things. One is, the rats will work for an opportunity to get into an arena where they know that play might occur. And so that's one of the scientific ways of testing an animal's motivation, right? So imagine you have a starving rat and it knows that it's got food down the end of a corridor. You can put a little spring on its tail and measure how hard it pulls and that gives you an indication of its motivational force. Now, imagine the starving rat that's trying to get to some food and you have a little spring on his tail and you waft in some cat odor. So now that rat is starving and wants to get out of there. He's gonna to try to pull even farther towards the food. So getting away plus getting forward are separate motivational systems and if you can add them together, it's real potent. And part of the reason why in the future authoring exercise that you guys are gonna do as the class progresses, you're asked to outline the place you'd like to end up, which is your desired future, and also the place that you could end up if you let everything fall apart is so that your anxiety chases you and your approach systems pull you forward. You're maximally motivated then. And it's important because otherwise you can be afraid of pursuing the things that you want to pursue, right? And that's very common. And so then the fear inhibits you as the promise pulls you forward, but it makes you weak because you're afraid. You want to get your fear behind you, pushing you. And so what you want to be is afraid, more afraid of not pursuing your goals than you are of pursuing them. It's very, very helpful. And lots of times in life, and this is something really worth knowing, you know, and this is one of the advantages to being an autonomous adult, is you don't get to pick the best thing, you get to pick your poison. You have two bad choices and you get to pick which one you're willing to suffer through. And every choice has a bit of that element in it. And so if you know that, it's really freeing, because otherwise you torture yourself by thinking, well, maybe there's a good solution to this, you know, compared to the bad solution. It's like, no, no, sometimes there's just risky solution one and risky solution two. And sometimes both of them are really bad, but you at least get to pick which one you're willing to suffer through. And that's, that actually makes quite a bit of difference because you're also facing it voluntarily then instead of it chasing you. And that is an entire different, entirely different psychophysiological response. Challenge versus threat, it's not the same, even if the magnitude of the problem is the same. And so putting yourself in a challenging, let's call it mind frame, you can't just do that by magic. Putting yourself in a challenging mind frame is much, much easier on you psychophysiologically because you don't produce, you don't go into the generalized stress response to the same degree. And you're activating your exploratory and seeking systems which are dopaminergically mediated and that involve positive emotion. So if you can face something voluntarily rather than having it chase you, it's way better for you psychophysiologically. So that's partly why, well, it's worthwhile to go find the dragon in its lair instead of waiting for it to come and eat you. So, and especially when you also add the idea that if you go find the dragon in its lair, you might find it when it's a baby instead of a full-fledged bloody monster that is definitely going to take you down. And so that's part of the reason why, well, there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that emerge out of that observation, like don't avoid small problems that you know are there face them because they'll grow into big problems all by themselves. And you can think about, imagine the tax department sends you a notification. You owe them like $300. Well, it's, it's you know, that's annoying. Maybe you don't even want to open the letter. Or maybe if you do, you just put it on the shelf. But that damn thing doesn't just sit there like a piece of paper on the shelf, right? You ignore that for five or six years, it's going to become attached to all sorts of horrible things. And if you ignore it long enough, you get the idea. It's going to turn into something that is completely unlike the little piece of paper that it's written on. And, and many, many problems in life are like that. You'll see, they'll, you'll see that they pop their ugly little head up and you know, and you might want to turn away. You might not want, not want to think about it, which is the easiest way of turning away, right? You just don't attend to it. It's not like you repress it or anything like that. You just fail to attend to it. And that's a really, as a long-term strategy, it's dismal. It's also something I think that's more characteristic of people who are high in neuroticism and high in agreeableness, because agreeable people don't like conflict. And people who are high in neuroticism, who are high in negative emotion, 
are hit harder per unit of uncertainty or threat. And so, you know, and that's partly why in psychotherapy, a lot of times the people you see need assertiveness training, so that would be the opposite of agreeableness, or they need to help get their anxiety and emotional pain under control. It's, those are not the only reasons. There's antisocial behavior, but you can't fix that in therapy in all likelihood. There's alcoholism. There's lots and lots of other reasons, but those are two major reasons.